Hey guys, Steve from Unexplored Films here, and today we're going to be showing you how we did our factory explosion effect using a combination of a miniature scale model and VFX. So we actually filmed this effect quite a few years ago in 2015, and this is a re-upload of a previous video because I was never completely happy with the final result, and I recently revisited the project and tried to find ways of making it better. And this is now the updated video for how we did the effect. It's still not as good as what we would be able to do these days, but I think it's a lot better than it was, and we'll probably try something much better looking in the future. And if you're interested in filmmaking and mixing practical and visual effects, then subscribe and you'll see lots more stuff like this. Now, miniature pyrotechnic effects are often seen as a more old-fashioned form of filmmaking, and can usually be seen in shows that don't disguise that they're using miniatures like Thunderbirds or films like Team America, but actually a surprising amount of films still use these to create some really convincing effects. Having said that, these effects are usually only 100% effective with a high budget and some large-scale miniatures, and of course professional pyrotechnics. So this is not designed as a tutorial for you to try at home, this is more of a demonstration of what we were able to do as a very basic test. So we wanted to experiment combining a practical model with pyrotechnics and some digital finishing touches. Elements like fire and water are always incredibly difficult to scale down and make look smaller, so this is why filmmakers always start with the largest model they can in order to make these elements not look too big. Professional models for pyrotechnics are normally made in order to break apart very easily, and they're usually made from specific substances like sawdust or plaster of Paris, or individual pieces of material like wood, and when they explode they genuinely look like they are breaking apart. For really high-end films they might even put miniature furniture or smaller objects inside. Now as this was an initial very basic test, we didn't have access to anything like this, and we simply tried using an existing scale model from a model railway kit. So I'm sure we'll try something more ambitious than this in a future episode, but for this initial test, this was simply a model that was already commercially available, and we thought we'd try and find ways of making parts of it break apart. So when building the model kit, we loosely glued the sections together, added some loose debris already into the container at the top of the building, and in particular left the roof over the gatehouse area loose, and we built the chimney on a hinge so that it would be more likely to fall over. But again, this was a very budget-friendly version of what you would usually construct from scratch for an effect like this. Next, we had a decision to make about our background. Now, with this sort of thing, you basically have three options. You could either film it in a physical location and try and use real sky and real background behind, or you could film it in a studio and use a studio backdrop that looks like an outdoor location, or you can film it in front of a blue or green screen and try and remove that later. Although, as we'll see, this can present problems because you're trying to remove difficult things like smoke. But for this initial experiment, we tested the green screen method and we got some footage of a real factory to drop in behind our model. Then we set the model up outside in a controlled environment. The size of the model will also affect the frame rates you should be filming at. Miniature pyrotechnics are normally filmed at high frame rates so that when you play them back later, the explosion will look bigger and last longer, and any falling objects will seem heavier. The higher the frame rate, the larger it should look. Now, the scale of our model was a big challenge. This was at 1 to 76 scale, and normally pyrotechnic models would be something like 1 to 24 scale. So something this small should be filmed at at least 120 frames or higher. Now, at the time, the camera we were filming with couldn't do 120 frames per second, so we filmed it at 60. You should also set your shutter speed to at least double your frame rate in order to get movement that isn't too blurry. Another thing to bear in mind is that the lower your camera is to ground level, or what looks like ground level, the larger the model should look. Now we wanted a little bit of the ground still visible in order to show the debris landing, but I think if we were going to film this again, we would probably get our camera even lower. I think next time we would also film with a wider lens and get a bit closer. For our pyrotechnic charges, we were using gunpowder that you would find in something like a cap gun. So these were powder-based, they weren't liquid-based or anything like that, because that was the safest method to use for this test, and of course we also had measures like a fire extinguisher standing by. We planted our two main explosives, one under the roof and one next to the factory chimney, and we kept a third one in reserve just around the corner from the doorway. So then we set off our charges one by one, first was the chimney, then it was the one under the roof, and then finally the third one, which sent some fire through the doorway. Then we were done, and it was time to begin editing. So we built this shot in Adobe After Effects, and because the camera hadn't moved, we could make a composite of all these best little moments to create the best possible version of the factory explosion. 
Next, we could remove the green screen using key light. This now meant our factory element could be added on top of the layer containing our background scenery. Then for the foreground, I actually built this in Photoshop out of various stock images of factory buildings and wasteland and gravel and that sort of thing. And because we had filmed the factory from a slightly higher height than we probably should have done, that's why we added the hill in the foreground so that it felt like you were looking down on the factory and that didn't feel so strange. I deliberately put the building in the foreground where it is because when the chimney fell over it bounced. Now of course if it was a real heavy chimney it wouldn't do that, so the building in front of it hides this. Now when we began this test we weren't sure how much of the real fire we would be able to use and because the flame still looked way too big, because the model was of course way too small, eventually we just decided to use the initial explosion as a real element and then digital fire and smoke elements would take over. Because we'd filmed this on a green screen and all the smoke was going to be quite difficult to remove, that also added to the decision to mainly use digital fire once the explosion had happened. So we found the best way was to draw a mask around the fire just at the very beginning and then reduce that in size almost immediately. So we only see our real fire very briefly when the explosion happens and then the digital fire takes over. The fire and smoke elements we used were from various collections available online. These ones were from Production Crate and Video Copilot. So we have a large fireball going up into the sky and then we we also have a column of black smoke which has been added behind it. Then some more fire starts to spread along the factory roof slowly, out to the left and out to the right. And there's also fire in the doorway that continues to burn. A fun one was adding a little smoke plume to the top of the chimney just as it gets knocked and it falls over. I also found a neat trick was to slowly darken all of the top of the factory roof as the fire continues to burn. And it just looks like the fire is actually affecting the building and it hasn't just been slapped on top. We have a big dust cloud added when the chimney lands and also some foreground shockwave dust that comes towards the camera. Then it was really a game of just trying to add any more elements and make it look like it was at a better scale. Like this row of parked cars and that instantly made the factory look bigger. And some little barrels as an extra detail. And then also some extra debris elements on top of the practical debris. Now we were limited to quite a small area where the practical debris could fall, but now that we had digital debris this could land on the areas that we had added like the digital foreground. Then we could add some more trees and bushes just to fill out the frame a bit. And then some weather elements and some haze on top to make the factory look a little bit further away. I also created what looks like a heat haze over the factory by using the turbulent displace effect. It can distort the image and make it look like you're seeing something through a patch of very hot air. If you add this effect to an adjustment layer and then draw a mask around it, you can limit it to just one area. Then another adjustment layer with the Lumetri colour effect added allowed me to do some colour grading to the whole shot. Finally adding a camera move to this made the whole shot come alive and a bit of camera wobble using the wiggle effect. Then we built a soundscape using sound effects like a large oil and gas explosion, some burning fire underneath, noises of debris landing, some dust and dirt landing, and an alarm going off to feel like there's been a really heavy tremor. And then it was time to look back at the finished effect. So I hope this was interesting as a basic test for showing how we combined practical miniatures with pyrotechnics and a lot of digital finishing touches. I still wish I'd been able to film this at a higher frame rate, but we will definitely be trying that next time we attempt this effect, so make sure you stay tuned for that. I have been Steve from Unexplored Films, and I'll see you next time.